I'm Nick. This is Anna. <laughs> so what do we work on? We work on the MS family study. So as Tracy said, I've got MS and Nick is the lead researcher in the study. So we know that between one in four and one in six people with MS have a family history of MS. We also know that 50% of MS risk is genetic, but MS is not considered an inherited disease. I actually find that a really confusing statement, so I'm going to try and explain it a little bit. So an inherited disease might be something like Huntington's disease, where you can see, you can test for a gene, you can see it passed down through family members, and each person with that gene will develop that disease. But MS um, is not like that, it's like other autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis or maybe type 1 diabetes, where family history is important, but there's a lot of other things going on as well. Despite all of that, we do see rare families where there are more than one case of MS and it appears that MS might be being passed down through the family. Now, this is a pedigree or a family tree, male represented by a square and female by a circle. And in this one, the yellow is people with MS and the white is people without. So who would you recruit for our study from this one. So we invite families like this that have three or more members that have multiple sclerosis and we recruit people that have MS and the parents and relatives over 50 years of old that do not have uh, MS. So in this family tree, we would take everyone that we have the, the red arrow next to. And you can see in that bottom generation, uh, we wouldn't have invited the, the brother to participate because he's not over 50 yet. So he's, he's too young to be considered truly unaffected or not having MS. But you would eventually recruit him yes. when he's old enough? Yeah. Or if he develops Or MS. if he develops MS. So why do we study genetics? So we're interested in this stuff called DNA. Um, it's your genetic code. It's inside all the cells of your body. It's shown in this picture here is that, that green ladder going across the screen. Your genetic code, we represent it as letters. So A's, C's, T's and G's. And this is what defines you as you. There are similarities and differences between all of us in the room. Uh, so Anna and I will share DNA changes or differences in our code that you do not have. We're not related, we are Tasmanian. <laughs> um, but there are also differences. And so those differences that are important because we're looking for differences uh, that are related to MS, that uh, increase the risk of disease or that contribute to the disease development. So when we're talking about the entire complement or the entire DNA code, we're talking about the genome. So you hear us saying genome a few times today. So typically uh, MS genetics is uh, studied by comparing the DNA of people who do not have MS, so large groups of those people, to large groups of people who do have MS. And we're looking at the, the differences in the DNA code frequency between these two groups. So in this example, you can see the red bar for the people that have MS is a bit higher. So that DNA change might be associated with risk of developing MS. But in this large population of people that have MS, there might be an individual that has a really strong family history of disease. And that person may have specific changes to them that are related to the development of their, their MS that are not able to be detected in the population at large. But they have, we call these changes rare DNA changes, but they have a family history. So they come from a family of multiple people with MS and we can see those rare DNA changes being passed down through the family or inherited. So we can detect multiple copies of those rare DNA changes in the family that we can't see in the population just because they're so rare. So we study families like these because of our hypothesis that rare DNA changes play a major role in why some relatives develop MS and others do not. So how do we identify those changes? So this is our family. You can see there the code, the DNA code below. So the first step is that, like Nick said, two people share lots of DNA changes. There's lots of things there that we know are not important. So I like to think of this as the sorting the wheat from the chaff step. There's a whole lot of stuff they can just throw out. 
The next step is really interesting. So the researchers know from past experience and knowledge that there are some parts of some genes that code for processes that are, that are important in MS, so uh, immune function and brain function, that sort of thing. So they can look in those places to see if there are changes in the affected family members that might predict a functional effect. So I like to think of this as the best bang for your buck step. Next, they need to exclude any changes where the unaffected family members also have that DNA change. And then they need to check that each affected family member has the DNA change. And that leaves them with um, a set of DNA changes for each family to take on to further experiments. So I just wanted to step back a minute and talk about the history of this study a little bit. And we've seen a few timelines today that are going up and down the side of the screen, but mine goes across, so I've <laughs> got to be different. So this study uh, began back in 2015 or possibly a little earlier with, with Dr. Jack Charlesworth and Professor Bruce Taylor, where um, a single family became involved in the study that uh, you can see. So I'm going to have a bar graph here of the number of families and the dots are the number of people that have been genome sequenced. So from that first family, eight people were genome sequenced. Uh, in around 2016, that went up to three families with 10, 20 genomes, and I became involved briefly before I scuttled off to the US for um, a, a postdoc position. But then a number of geneticists became involved working with these three families to find those DNA changes inherited with MS in these families. And then the biologists can be involved, the people like Kayleen, studying these changes in the laboratory to ask questions about the genes and how they might be linked to MS. And the research progressed this way over a number of years, just focusing on these three families. We received the MRFF uh, flagship funding, and that was uh, uh, one of the reasons why I came back to Tasmania uh, to, to work on this study and lead this study, uh, along with other researchers, including my colleague, Dr. Jessica Fletcher. And with the funding boost from the MRFF and our involvement of other people, including someone that might look a little familiar, um, the, the project started to grow. And in the coming years, the number of families that we had involved increased to where we are today, where we have 18 families with multiple cases of MS recruited and 67 genomes generated. And a whole raft of students and postdocs and research assistants and study coordinators involved in uh, working with this study and asking the questions of the data. So something that I think is interesting uh, but not uh, necessarily useful to people with MS is the cost of genome sequencing over time. So back in 2015, it cost around 5,000 Australian dollars to sequence a single genome. So it's quite cost prohibitive, but with advances in technology over time, the cost of genome sequencing has fallen and we can now generate a genome in the laboratory for around $600 a person, which is much more uh, affordable. affordable. <laughs> Um, so, of course, with, with uh, research there, we need funding. Um, so the original funding uh, for the MS families began with the Marmion family, which is a family in South Texas that, that Jack uh, knew and worked with when she was over there. But there's been lots of other funding contributions across the years with the major funding injection from the Medical Research Future Fund that sent this study skyrocketing in its, its capacity and its scope. So what do some of the families involved in this study look like? So here's a few of the family trees. You can see like your own families, they're all different shapes and sizes, um, but everyone uh, that has MS in these, these family trees is colored in black. And we can see at least three people in each family that has MS. So for each family, there's a number of steps that we go through. It begins with recruitment, usually over the phone, sometimes a Zoom call. We have to arrange sample collection to collect a blood or a saliva sample to extract DNA from to do the genome sequencing, to read the, the genetic code of these people. Then it becomes the analysis. Now this is the, often the time consuming part the, where we uh, are looking for those rare DNA changes, we're interpreting the results, we're going back to the analysis and back and forth to settle on our best candidates to take through to developing research questions about 
and designing experiments to test what those findings mean. Now we use research tools or models, you now all know what a model is, and research tools in the laboratory including animal, uh, an animal-based tool and some human-based tools that we'll talk about a little bit in a moment to test those questions. We need to conduct the experiments in the lab and we go back and forth because um, experiments lead to more questions before we finally interpret the results and sometimes go back and design more experiments to try and understand the story fully. So one of the ways that the researchers tested some of their questions about cha DNA changes, so this is one of the families that has two changes and they're using an animal model, so a mouse model in this case, to test it. So they have bred two different mouse lines with one chain DNA change each, and then they breed them together to get a mouse with the two DNA changes. And then they've bred a bunch of those mice, and then they follow them over time. So those are all the time points you can see there. And at each time point, they do motor or movement testing and harvest some of the mice so they can look at their brains. Now, this is one of the movement tests that they did. So this is called the beam walk. So the mouse runs along a little pole and the researcher counts how many times the foot slips off. This graph shows the um, control results. So for the control mice, and you can see that the mice get worse at this test over time. So they're slipping more. This graph shows the mice with the DNA changes. So you can see that they're worse right from the start there and they're much worse over time as well. So this is showing that there's a functional change in the mice with the DNA changes. They did another movement test as well called a grid walk. So the mouse runs across a wire grid and they count how many times the foot slips. Again, in the, well, in the control group here, you don't see them getting worse over time but you can see that the mice with the DNA change are worse at every time point here. So backing up that idea that something is happening in the mice with the DNA change. Now, that's really interesting, Nick, but it's not MS and it didn't lead to MS. So why is that important? So mice are not tiny humans, unfortunately. Um, but this is, this is one piece of the puzzle. What we've established here is that these DNA changes do something. Uh, they are important, they have a functional effect. Um, this is quite uh, novel in terms of the scope of MS family genetics to have proof that the DNA changes have an effect. It's part of the puzzle. Um, they're causing a movement deficit in mice, but this is not necessarily MS. So we're now using this this tool, this model, to ask another question, which is, do mice with these DNA changes, are they more vulnerable to demyelination? Because we know demyelination is important in multiple sclerosis. So are these mice more vulnerable to demyelination? So we're starting with our research tool, uh, two changes from one family. We have another family where we've identified uh, six DNA changes. So we've, we have a lot of complex mouse breeding. Um, those mice have been generated and we have our control mice that do not have any of the DNA changes. And we're giving these mice a treatment, a, a, an experimental treatment, not, ex not experimental, they're participating the mice against their, not necessarily. They, <laughs> we're giving different groups of mice a treatment. One is receiving no treatment and we can take a look at their brains and we can see what their myelin is looking like in the brain. So this is a, a section through the, the mouse's brain and you can see that that yellow glow is the, a, a painting of the, the tissue that looks like myelin. The other treatment we give them is part of their diet and this uh, is a chemical that induces demyelination in the brain. So we're forcing demyelination upon the mice. And we can see that once demyelination has happened that the myelin uh, starts to break down in the mouse brain. Um, so you can see the, the two pictures are a little different. So what we are asking with our tools is are the mice with the changes more vulnerable to this demyelination? And what are the differences when we're thinking about demyelination between these different research tools to help us understand how these changes are more closely linked to multiple sclerosis? Okay, so you want to see how those three groups react when they have, what happens next after the demyelination? Yes. So 
So we also look at DNA changes in human cells. Um, so this comes from the MS stem, which Kayleen was just talking about, um, where I don't need to explain what a stem cell is. But we take stem cells, um, we create blood sample, we take blood samples from participants in the study, we create stem cells, and we can use these to make brain cells. And this takes many months or, or years to, to get to this point. But those brain cells each have the DNA code of their original donor, which means they also have the rare genetic changes that we are interested in. We can then create brain cells using DNA editing that have those specific DNA changes removed. So we can... Can I just say, that's really cool. <laughs> Is it cooler than the cells working around <laughs> on the dish? Well, that was, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we remove those changes, we are creating an experimental tool where we're specifically studying the effect of that specific change. So by taking it away, we're creating the, the right control group um, to look at that specific DNA change. And you've seen some lovely pictures of oligodendrocytes at the top, uh, astrocytes and those pericytes, the blood-brain barrier capillary cells, um, where we've painted these pictures with, with some labels that mark what they are um, from, from MS STEM. So this is work Alastair Fortune, a PhD student, has been doing. <coughs> and um, so the as you saw from Kayleen's talk, the cells don't look uh, vibrant and radioactive underneath the microscope. Normally, we have to paint them to do that. They look quite boring normally. Um, I'm going to get in trouble for saying that later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what a really exciting finding from Alastair's work with, with the pericytes has been to add myelin debris or myelin rubbish that's broken down into the culture dish. And we can see, this is possibly for the first time ever, that myelin is eaten by the pericytes. So those cells that are forming the blood-brain barrier or part of it can take up myelin that is floating around in the, in, in the dish. Um, so this might be quite important in understanding how myelin is processed in, in multiple sclerosis. And this is still setting up your experiments, right? You're not even, you're not even doing that experiment at the top with the... Yeah, to comparing the differences. Yeah. We have the research tools now. Um, we have the, another piece of the puzzle here where work is under the way. We have the tools ready and established and we're continuing this work with funding from the NHMRC um, with our ideas a grant. We've got those early findings of differences between MS cells and non-MS cells, but now we're looking at the specific DNA changes as well. So in summing up a bit, you've got the changes from all the families and you're hoping to take all that new knowledge and use it as clues to try and help the population of people with MS. How do you see that happening? So we're interested in the DNA changes in each specific family and understanding how that specific change is involved in MS, but we're looking for those overlaps, be it overlapping at the gene level, so the same gene across different families, or the same types of genes across different families to point us at a, a biological pathway in the middle. Because we think when we've identified those pathways, we can then uh, look for, for drugs that target or modify that pathway, which may be a therapeutic option for people with MS to alleviate or alleviate their symptoms or prevent our progression of the disease. So that's our, our overall goal at the end of the day. So we've found DNA changes from these families that affect brain function and immune function genes. There are different changes in the same gene in two of the families, which is a really recent finding that we're starting to think about and look at more just to um, build up those questions to ask in the laboratory. And we're finding different changes in the same biological pathway in three of the families. So we're pretty excited about that. So normally, um, well, We've done, this is our third time co-presenting together. Normally we start with us rather than the science. We want to give you more of a science talk today, but we'll just touch back on uh, our consumer researcher relationship a little bit as well. So that first picture is us talking at this event last year. Um, since then we have continued to catch up regularly and have coffee and talk about cof coffee and talk about uh, Nick tells me about the research and what's happening, whether there are results, whether there's anything I can help with. 
Um, and I talk about my MS and what's happening and how I feel about it. Um, and I, I, Nick's been following me probably since I was a bit more than a year past diagnosis till now, so that's quite an important time in my MS journey um, to, to hear about along the way. Yeah, so as a researcher, just like Anne was talking about, I, I knew people with MS, but I'd never interacted in a, in a research capacity of thinking about what what is my, um, how does my research relate to Anna as a person that has MS? Um, so I get to think about Anna in the context of the research that I do. We've been applying for uh, new grant applications, which Anna is a co-investigator on, so hopefully one of those will be successful uh, in this coming year as well. And we got, uh, we were invited to present at MS Australia's Progress in MS talk, uh, conference last year, which was really exciting. But the consumer involvement definitely benefits us and the project as well. Um, we've got a fairly unique relationship, uh, we think, um, because it takes time and, and passion to be involved. Um, we've got the flexibility of the one-on-one. -on -one. So we have our meetings and we've had several leading up to today to build this talk together. And things pop up, life happens. Um, you know, it's, it's Monday, Monday and we're supposed to meet at 9.30. And we'll- I've got sick kids at home. <laughs> I'm like, no worries, let's meet on Zoom. Yeah. Or do you want to meet on Zoom? Are the kids okay? You know, it's that yeah. kind of flexibility. Um, and that flexibility has come with the, the, the building up of the relationship over time. Mm. I get to reinterpret the research from Anna's perspective and she challenges me to think about the research in ways that I, I wouldn't really normally. So for me, I think the more that we've talked, the more we trust each other and it continues like that. I think that's not just true for us though, that's true for the whole of the flagship researchers and consumers. Um, we've become friends through this time, that's screenshots of sending each other text messages about um, gardens and stuff, <laughs> holidays. Mine grew better. <laughs> Um, and then one other thing I wanted to say is one of the times I've learned the most about the research is writing talks because there's nothing like having to explain something to really ask a lot of questions about it. To just end on a final note, I would usually introduce Anna as a knitter because she's a knitter and she used to knit her bits as part of a women's health initiative. And I would say one of the, the growth I have seen in Anna is moving on to knitting more complex structures, <laughs> um, which I have with me today, and it's, it's a great scarf. <laughs> so we've, we've talked about our consumer involvement and Anna's role in this partner uh, throughout. And just a final note to, to thank all the contributors to this project and our funding group. Thank you very much.